Hello everybody, we are back with uh, yet another uh, coach chat uh, and uh, our guest for today is none other than Ian Shippey, uh, a mental coach from South Africa. So, uh, but people, as usual, let me first start by asking you to, to, to let us know uh, in, the, in the comment section that you are here, where you are from, so that we have an idea who's in the audience that we can uh, relate to you. Uh, and as always, let's make this an interactive session. So ask as many questions as you can, ask as many, uh, make as many remarks as you can. If you disagree, let us know in the comments uh, and we will bring you on screen and, uh, and, and, and talk about that. So uh, uh, he will do, will deliver his presentation at the end. There's the usual Q&A, but no, do not hesitate to, to interrupt with your questions uh, if you feel it is, uh, it is urgent. So, um, uh, Ian, uh, welcome, welcome aboard here. Uh, very happy to mm -hmm. have uh, again a South African on on the, on the show here. Always good to have people from different continents uh, sharing the knowledge with us. Um, you've been a mental coach for for for, for many 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 years. Uh, been involved with uh, different sports, uh, usually team sports. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and the most recent experience uh, for you was uh, at the Commonwealth Games with the uh, South African national men's team who did uh, extremely well. And I and, uh, and, uh, finished fourth, I think, uh, just outside of a podium. But that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, effort there. Um, uh, you've had lots of experience with that team uh, building towards uh, a clean ego. Uh, and I love the, the, the topic of this. So... Uh, Let's start talking about uh, the power of a clean ego. Ian, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ernst. And, and I'll get to the topic in just a minute. Ernst, thank you. Just as you were um, reminiscing about the Commonwealth Games, I can clearly remember our first phone call. You reached out to me while I was in Birmingham um, on Facebook or text or things. And mm -hmm. I can remember uh, the devastation of losing the bronze medal match and mm -hmm. uh, passing time in a coffee shop on a high street not far from the, the university where we played and it, it it was so welcoming just connecting and I've so valued just what we've got up to in the last six weeks or so as I, I think we've found quite a quick synergy and and partnership so it's lunchtime in South Africa and I know that's <laughs> true in Central Europe yeah so whether you're joining us earlier in the day from the Americas or Canada or across in Asia or the Australasias, thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate you leaning in. And I think a win for Ernst and I would just be, yeah, if, if we provoke or sow some seed thoughts that would just have you consider the way you coach and play. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mindful that most of the audience is typically um, coaches in the hockey space, but mm -hmm. um, uh, there are players I know that are on board today and business folk and Ernst and I are going to be doing more and more in that space in the short term. So, yeah, over to the topic. And yeah, Ernst just wanted to thank you for giving me such an easy topic for the very first masterclass. Um, <laughs> always, always happy to give uh, a challenge. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I, maybe I wouldn't have given you this subject. I gave it a, about a month ago. So. My aspiration is to take something that might seem a bit mysterious, a bit intangible and make it tangible. And I'm going to start by just sharing three brief stories and then and then we'll dive into some some what's some uh, whys and then and then finish on a practical note of application on on really the how to 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 massage this into your coaching environment. But what has been an incredible privilege for me just in the last, I guess it's going on six weeks now, is I had three weeks with the men's national team at the Birmingham Games and was there with the mighty Australians and Englands and Indias and others. So it was near these majestic young athletes. And soon after coming back, uh, a lot of players and uh, leaders of the Masters World Cup sides, that's the 45s, the 50s and 55s are about to embark on the World Cup in Cape Town in just about just over a week's time. And suddenly I found myself amongst a group of elite athletes of a different generation. And it's been fascinating 
just being on a journey with them. And David Reed Ross, some of you might know the name Justin Reed Ross. His son might be more familiar to you. Justin played for South Africa for many years and has played in the Nederlands for Hoofdklasse for some time, an incredible drag flicker and, and backline player. But David is an extraordinary person in that he is a coach. He is of the tender age of 65 and he plays in our South African men's 55 year old team. And I play against him regularly on a Monday night, but have had the privilege in the last few weeks of getting closer to him as he is the player coach for our national 55s. David um, played for South Africa in what we often refer to as our isolation or the end of the apartheid era. And some commentators say, and he, he, he don't the goalkeeper pads from the late 70s to the late 80s. And some say he could have been the finest goalkeeper in the world at that time. He now plays outside left half. But I was in a context with him as player coach and the South African men's 55 year old team um, in a boardroom at the Wanderers Club just two weekends ago. And David for me was the epitome of what we're talking about today, a clean ego. He is 65, he's endeavored to teach some of the older players some new skill, uh, new skills, 3D skills, other things, but he's also wanted to move um, the approach towards coaching. And he was incredibly mindful that he came from a different generation, that he's often harsh in the way that he approaches the subject of coaching and the way he gives feedback. So he initiated uh, this conversation with the team and I was the facilitator with an honest sort of an apology and um, an appeal to engage around his coaching style. And for the next two hours, I witnessed um, men who are at a minimum age of 55 through to 60 engaging around how they could better communicate with one another in a player coach relationship and in a peer player relationship. Now, being a little bit younger than those gentlemen at 53, I, I think it's fair to say that most South African men being born between 1960 and 1980 are, when it comes to EQ or emotional intelligence, we are dinosaurs, um, something um, out of Jurassic Park. And to see these men grapple with that and to David to vulnerably express and appeal to the team of how he could be a better coach was an example of clean ego to me. I'll briefly mention our men's national coach, Gareth Ewing. He has just been nominated for one of FIH's Coaches of the Year. Um, I think uh, we stand as the men's side as one of the most improved um, top ranking hockey teams in the world in the top 20 for what we did at the Tokyo Olympics and, and now coming just recently out of the Commonwealth Games. But Gareth, um, in the last three years in his term, has surrounded himself with people who have a complementary skill set and he's aware of his limitations. He knows where he operates best between the four lines, but he brings others in to um, allow them to complement what he does. Another man of incredible stature who's achieving greatly, but there is another picture of a clean ego. And um, I need to throw myself into the mix here, um, just, just in case any of my friends and teammates are on the call. Uh, the challenge when you present on a subject like that is that you, this, you go through a, quite a sort of baptism of fire yourself because um, uh, lest we be hypocritical in this space ourselves. So um, the mirror, um, I look into the mirror regularly on this basis and um, found myself sitting with my therapist this last Monday, um, caught up in the passion of the Commonwealth Games and all that took place to, to finish fourth place. Um, I had neglected a few areas in my home life in uh, my domestic life. And um, I had to glaringly be shown uh, some of the blind spots in, in my own life that are the size of the Titanic. So um, here I sit 
I'm mentioning this to you, but um, I'm speaking to myself as much as trying to inspire you today. So the power of a clean ego. Ernst, can we maybe just get on to, to some of the definitions as we, we build upon those narratives? So I'm not sure um, what uh, your association with the word ego is, but many just see it from a negative perspective. They see it as being self-centered, being arrogant. But I think Freud, when he initially used the word, was speaking about the conscious mind, um, talking about our existence, our identity. But we tend to use it in saying he or she has a swollen ego, such a big ego. But I want to also touch on the polar opposite of that today as we try to make this tangible because we're aspiring to build uh, teams that have a clean ego and coaches under our influence um, to, to have that purifying cleansing process so that they can play at the optimum. So I just want to mention that there are two sides of the ego. Let me, at the risk of oversimplifying this, say this. When it comes to the clean ego, it's a part of us where we feel good about ourselves. Um, we understand our values and we will defend those and stand up for those. It's a healthy self-focus. Um, using modern language, it might be a mindfulness. I'm mindful of my own thinking, my own behavior and how that impacts others. And in that mindfulness, I'm able to almost stand apart from myself and look in on myself without too harsh a judgment. Yes, with an aspiration to be better, but there's not a, a judgmental edge that that totally erodes the essence of who I am. So a clean ego is something that we aspire to have. It, it can be a clean ego to pursue a gold medal, to, to want to do incredibly well at the uh, Masters World Cup, to be... And, the best coach that you possibly can be to be the best parent that is the sign of a clean ego. But ego, if you look at the flip side, um, and I'm going to speak about two different components, there's, there's a really dark side to the ego. And I don't think we would have to go further than just mentioning the word Putin and his agenda for the last few months. And just to see at that dark master craftsman, um, horrific agenda, and um, there can be a dark side to us. Um, as I mentioned, I play in a Monday night league um, of men um, 45 and older. And there is a certain gentleman in our league that, that I spoke to just two weeks ago. He has a tendency to hit a ball at such velocity into someone's ankle from just a foot away when he could just pop it onto the person's foot to to get the call his way once or twice a game he has an incredibly powerful hit and when there's someone literally half a meter away he will smash it and um i'm not prone to to boil over or to get into a state of rage but two monday nights ago he released the ball with such power that I wondered whether he had broken my colleague's ankle. And I went up to him in a state of rage and I said, what the hell are you doing? I, I just said, this is a master's senior competitive league and what are you doing? What is driving you to do that? And I said, we actually don't want you playing here on a Monday night if you want to play like that. Please think about why you are playing. What is it in you that has to release a ball with such velocity in a master's league that could literally break ankles? So what's driving that? Um, which might lead to to the broken side, and I'm not trying to make assumptions about that player, but I think maybe one of the best words to use when we speak about the broken side of ego is what we ruminate about, and the word ruminate speaks about what we dwell on. So this is a negative self-focus and an often down spirals. So we look in on ourselves, but as opposed to a healthy mindfulness where we see areas to adjust and correct, it starts a down spiraling that that can be incredibly negative and 
and destructive. So that's, that's, that's a, an attempt to define it. Um, I'm sure there's some social scientists on the call and we could be better about it, but we're saying that there's a good healthy part of the ego and there's a very potentially destructive side or a very broken side. And, and those parts are important to comprehend if we are to, as coaches and players, um, see about how we can um, speak and act and coach in this space. So let's look at why is it so important that we understand this and, and, and how can we come in as coaches, as players, as business leaders into the space. So if you do have access to the slides, um, some of you are listening on audio, but I'm, I'm going to read some of this to you. And now we're looking at the why. The why is we want to be transformative coaches. We want to unconditionally accept people and take them on a transformative journey with outcomes that outlast the shine of the podium. I, I refer to Gareth Ewing, our national coach again, during COVID, the hard sort of COVID lockdown time, we, we looked at what we aspire to achieve as a South African men's team. As a group of coaches, as a team of staff, in addition to wanting to play in the top 10 in the world and wanting to, to shoot the lights out in every event we play in, we want to be able to look ourselves in the eye and say that men, young men who came into our program were transformed by the coaching and not just in their hockey skills and not just um, between the four lines, but just as human beings. We have a, we have a bigger motive. We have a, uh, an aspiration to draw thousands upon thousands of teenagers into the game that we love. There's, there's something bigger. I believe it's, we should chase the podium with every fiber of our being. But as I said to this group of 55-year-old men, as we culminated two Saturdays ago, I said, let's chase that medal. But the greatest prize, if you're sitting at 55, is that we're able to call each other when we're 80 and we're 85 to go out for a beer, to go for a walk, to support one another through the different stages of life. So I've quoted Anthony Moore here, and he says, when you commit to the process of never giving up, creatively overcoming setbacks and obstacles, trying new strategies, a powerful metamorphosis happens. You literally transform in the process. So going back to our definitions of ego, I think in, in most of us, there's com mostly all three components. There's that good, healthy side. There's that dark side that tries to show its head. Um, I'm sure any referees on here would be well familiar with the dark side of the ego. Um, and that is from the player's response to you. And, and then there's a broken side. And as coaches, we have the privilege of working with people. Many of us work in the youth space. Um, fatherlessness is a worldwide tragedy. Many of us become father figures, mother figures, mentors, more than just a hockey coach to people. In the country where I live, we have high density areas with um, literally hundreds of thousands of people living in close proximity. And surveys done in South Africa in 2010 when we hosted the Soccer World Cup said that the closest adult to an urban high density teenager is the soccer coach. So. As coaches, we have the ability to transform lives. So that's why we need to understand the ego, why we need to be able to recognize healthy signs, destructive signs, um, manipulative dark sides, because we are molding people. It happens to be through the game of hockey, but we ultimately molding people. And we have that incredible privilege of doing that. Uh, I will comment more on that just now when we get to some of the hows, but that is some of the whys. Let's, let's, let's go on to that one model. So um, there, there's a business consultant, Patrick Lencioni, I often refer to when working with business people, but this really helps in the sporting space as well. And he has a very simple definition of an ideal team player. And he says they're humble. I, I think that speaks for itself. 
They're hungry and those live in tension with one another because I'm hungry, I want to be the best, but there's a humility that holds it in tension. And at the bottom of um, the, the bottom of the three circles, if you're able to see that, is smart. And that smart doesn't have to do with intellectual IQ smarts, it has to do with EQ or interpersonal smarts. So you can be the hungriest player on the pitch, but not have people smarts, not know how to speak to your colleagues, um, lambaste them if they don't pass the ball exactly where you want it. Um, and those components of humility, hunger and smart need to be in tension with one another. And you see at the intersection of those three circles, the ideal team player. And I find that a very useful model and you can apply that to business or wherever. So let's start looking at the how. Let's, let's um, thanks, let's just go to that next slide. And maybe, this is the image of I, if I was a tattoo artist, this is the one I would want to put on your shoulder or imprint upon your mind is, coach, can you trigger and sustain an upward spiral? We're familiar with downward spirals in our own life where the day just goes south or whatever, your term is. We're familiar with that in a team environment where we might go two or three goals down in the first chakra and it just continues to spiral out of control. But can we be the catalyst of an upward spiral? Are we able to notice as a teenager comes to the astro at the end of a long, hard day, school's not going well, home is broken. Are we able to give them a foothold are we, like my dear friend, Coach Polo, able to have that eye contact, sense where they're at, connect with them, be the, the best part of their day, affirm their skills, give them a foothold, uh, an upward trajectory. I love the metaphor. I'm not sure if, if you have them in close proximity to where you live, but, but climbing walls and even in urban places have become very popular. So not just going to the cafes out in the country or but urban uh, climbing spaces and to to escalate up a wall, you need support structures, you need a rope, you need the safety. That's the environment that you create as a coach, that rope that people just feel that they can breathe out, they can be themselves in your presence. That's the safety harness, the rope. That's the environment you create. But are there those footholds that people can tangibly put a foot on? and press and, and thrust themselves upwards are their handholds and that for me um, is so important whether that is coming back from being 4-0 down and having to to regain control of the ball to put together a whole set of passes to not downward spiral that's a life lesson when life just is just crashing can i come back but are we able to be catalysts to cause an upward spiral Able, are we able to put that into the fabric of our team that we know our players next to us and and even if one of our friends is um, dropping their head, they've mistrapped the ball a few times, can we be a catalyst to to see them just move forward and, and progress in that game? Just in, in conclusion, I'm just going to look at maybe a few examples of what this looks like i'll just focus on a few if we can look at that next one of what what it, this could look like as you could be a player listening in today you could be a coach i know there could be some referees on we appreciate you very much uh, so coaches do you see the person in front of you as a whole person are you just seeing the hockey world or or, or do you want to be a role model, a positive influence in their lives? Do you see personal transformation as the, as the bigger prize? And my sense, we were chatting to Wade Payton, who's just won the, the men's league down in the city of Durban in South Africa. He has such a rapport with the young men that he coaches that he's able to pull those threads of relational capital and 
pull on them in a final to bring about a win because he's made so many deposits in their lives. They're motivated to play for one another and for the coach because there's something bigger taking place there, building a brotherhood. So is personal transformation the biggest prize? And I think if you build an environment that is so attractive, the players just keep coming back and back again. They will want to get fitter, stronger, more skilled, and will want to achieve results together. So you know, let's just maybe jump onto the next one. I'm just going to have a few of these, mindful of the time. Um, coaches, do you empower players to make decisions? Playing is about solving problems. It's about being one nil down and how do we come back? It's about our attacking short corner just not transferring into goals and having to change some of that strategy. It's about do we need to change the structure and the format because they've got two center links that are just dominating the field and, and we need to change our line or our format to counter that. So Gareth Ewing will often say, play what's in front of you. So once we get out of the Astro, that's the joy of, of seeing people develop. Um, so that's one point I want to mention there. Ernst, let's pop onto another slide. We'll, I think we can make this accessible. Um, yeah, someone with a clean e ego is able to acknowledge mistakes. Um, a coach with a clean ego understands that there needs to be a, a firewall between them and their team and they're not to dump emotionally on their team. They need another place to dump. That's with a peer, that's with a mentor. I had the privilege of working with the Springbok rugby team for years and I spoke to one of our most outstanding players who's a World Cup winner for Reed Dupree and I said, what do you want a coach to say to you at half time? Okay, rugby's not played in chuckers, it's played in, in two 40 minute halves. And he says, I don't want a coach to rub my face in what I've done wrong. I know what I've done wrong. I want him to tell me how to win the war and how to win the second half. So are, are we constructive? Do we, do we build people? Thanks, Ernst, we're just about there on this. Players, are you able to change position because it's better for the team? Are you able to play a whole game where your main role might just be to mark someone out the game? You won't be involved in attack much. You just have to shut down a creative player. Forwards, are you as happy to assist as to score the goal? And I'm going to take the very last one here. A clean ego is able to stand up for their, what they believe without being abrasive. So that's a look at the topic, hopefully just to pique your interest. And if you've got a pen or a phone handy, just to jot down a few thoughts. Here, I want to just give you three take-home thoughts. They're not on a slide here. Relook at your why. Why am I coaching? Why am I playing? Know your team. It sounds so simple, but know your teammates or the people you are coaching. And a real challenge. How are you going to start creating upward spirals in your environment? Ernst, I think that's an introductory dive into quite a vast subject. So let's get some feedback or questions or now now is the time going absolutely so now now is the time people to to bring on your questions so uh in the comment sections or or uh, use the link that you will find in the top of the comments to uh, to come on screen with us uh, we've got one comment here from uh, bert de boer from uh, the netherlands uh, from the club of campon so it says in top level sport you often see and high-level performance during the year is also intermingled with peak performances during tournaments. Is, I'm just trying to see, is there a question? Is that more of a comment? It's a comment, um, I think. It's a comment. Yeah, it's, it's more of a comment. Yeah. Maybe I'm just going to throw something in. It's, it, in the life cycle of sport, I work with a young swimmer in the United States. And I was talking to him about a season yesterday, and he wants to peak at certain times, and that's a that's a real skill, isn't it? 
-hmm. is that if your season is going for six or nine months, how is it that you peak at a, a certain time? Um, thank here's you for the comment. Uh, here's the question then from Bert. Uh, so this extra mental strain often causes them problems before or and especially after that event. And how do you deal with that? You make a you make a comment, and um, I was I was talking to a colleague at the Commonwealth Games, and and we had also made this decision within the South African camp that within the last few days we stopped with any mental coaching. Um, and I was talking to someone who I looked to as a mentor, and I said, what are you doing now in the Commonwealth Games at this stage? And he said to me, it's now not so much about performance, it's about mental health. And I guess we could break that down further, but um, two of the, the emotions that tend to drown players out in, in a big time are pressure to perform and a fear that I, I, I won't do well. And, and the skill in high performance sport is that I'm not drowning at that stage, that there's sufficient emotion to have ultimate and peak arousal, but I'm not totally drowned out by that. So I think we need to be incredibly mindful of our players, trying to, to watch. We've been doing exercises um, with our masters team here in conversation in the 21 days building up is how do I respond to pressure how will I communicate that to those places, people playing closest to me? And what do I need to hear under extreme pressure? Um, and that's verbal, that can be in body language. So I think, I think um, we have to study ourselves under extreme pressure. And, and uh, I think if we go to different scenarios, whether it's a, it's a special forces team we see simulating something, whether that's a pilot, who has to get an Airbus or a Jumbo off the ground. We need to simulate situations of extreme pressure um, to, to see how we cope. I have a friend, Paddy Upton, I look to immensely. He coaches um, cricket and, and the T20 under extreme pressure. And he did an example that might be more fitting for the warmer weather countries. But in some of his training in a day or two leading up to the event, they did underwater training of managing at a certain amount of meters underwater but the, the whole thing was about how do I handle pressure and it was what was what do I go to so I think the creative ideas we can throw around is how do I simulate pressure it doesn't have to be in your sport how do I problem solve and what do I do what sort of language do I use and and how do I be a shock absorber for that stress as opposed to acting it out because so often we act out the stress. I'm not sure if that's helpful. I, I hope it's helpful, uh, Bert, and otherwise uh, let, bring, bring on your extra comments, bring on your extra questions from here. Uh, just just not, not a question, but a compliment from uh, Christina from Argentina. Thank you very much. It was a great listen. Uh, how to create a good environment which increases the clean ego. Well, that's the question. How can you create a good environment which increases the clean ego? I, great question, um, and, and thank you. I hope you're able to understand my accent. Um, a lot of the, the exercise will be around our why. What is, what is the bigger purpose other than meddling, other than winning? What is the purpose? And what are the agreed values? And, and I think it's good to not just have a coach go away and just present those, but it's to co-create that. So I think a great way to do that is to, you know, to say, what is our why? And let's co-create our values. What, what are the non-negotiables about the environment? What, yeah, and how, how, sorry, so it's a why, then it's a, what are our values? But values need behaviors. So it, it's not good enough just to say, um, we are going to respect each other as brothers or sisters. That shows up as the way we speak to each other under pressure on the pitch. Do we speak about each other behind each other's back in the hotel room after the game? Or do we practice direct communication? So it's values. It's one thing to capture the value. But what are the behaviors that, that demonstrate that value or anchor that value?
mm-hmm. that helps. Yeah, got a question here from uh, Jorik from the Netherlands. How to deal with team players that are too eager, players that are too hungry? Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Is it 17 year old boys? Um, bu- 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 I think. In all honesty, I think players who are too hungry and too eager, we will find them in every age category. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, it, but but managing um, young male bodies flooded with testosterone is a challenge in itself. But um, I, I would rather deal with hunger than, than needing to get your team going. So, um, I'd rather be able to t- turn down the dial on hunger than not having it there. You, you need hunger. Um, but maybe it's asking questions of how does my behavior impact others? So, as I quoted the example of the one guy in my master's league, um, that yeah, that became toxic because he was destructive. He was so wanting to prove a point or, or the people around him to fear coming to tackle him that he, that he literally, literally breaking people. So I, I, I think it's to temper that, but you want people to have that passion, but anchor it into the values. But I think it's that other piece of that EQ is, can I still communicate? So, um, so, so maybe let me go to the tennis circuit. So, um, I think some of us will try and watch Roger Federer. I think tonight could be his last game out there in London. But obviously, the men matured over time, Roger and Rafa. But we've seen some younger men exploding on the circuits, um, and that's not a huge judgment call. It's pressurized. They're throwing rackets. They're going at, at umpires. So. As that matures, we see more a Federer and a dull approach where you can complement. But sometimes it's a maturation stage. But I think it's if you can show them if there are any destructive parts to their actions, but keep them hungry, but you want them to see the consequences of how they hurt, impact others or teammates or coaches or loved ones or opposition. So the consequences of my hunger, yeah. Yeah, um, a question for me. Well, well, I see that Bert is already writing some other questions, and we got some others coming up as well. But you gave the example of of of, of a South African situation where where children often grow up without a father. Uh, here in 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 Western Europe, uh, at, typically at hockey clubs, we encountered a lot of kids who have double families, who have who have, have uh, uh, parents. Father, mother, and and step parents as well, yeah. and, and 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 sometimes these parents can be very eager and and very competitive. So how do you deal with that as a coach when you're not only having to deal with with yeah building a clean ego for your players, but also their their, their surrounding their environment, the, the parents who are there maybe at the, at the, during the games or even during training sometimes. Absolutely. I- and I would always do that through the conduit of relationship. And um, I think I think it could be good at the start of a season or if there's a, an appropriate time to have a drink, a meal together, or just have a, in a more relaxed setting, you could, you could use it to articulate your vision, um, where you are, what you feel realistic expectations are. Sometimes you're taking over a club that is in a building process. Um, and it, it will climb the league as it goes on. But I think to build that communication bridge, um, I, I know a top uh, rowing coach who, who says, um, why, don't you, why don't you come and drop off your, your child early for training um, or stay later and let's, let's just chat about how things are going. So I think build that rapport of trust and um, and and maybe to talk about some of those things about um, not putting too much pressure. So as much as you, the, the wonderful question from Argentina of, of what are the values and that culture, 
expand that culture, Ernst, which you brought across so brilliantly, is what is our support culture look like? Um, so it's our club culture, which is not just the players, how we coach, how we play and how we support. And that takes time to build, um, but it takes trust to build. And sometimes it's challenging because we have young coaches with up against parents twice their age, but it starts with that relationship and that trust, yeah. Yeah, let's bring on a double question here from Bert. Uh, so we already have so much mental knowledge. How is it possible that in various sports, hockey, uh, but also gymnastics in, in, in Holland, that we continue, uh, this next one, that we continue to make big mistakes in the interpersonal aspect, leading to a tainted sports environment? Do you think that the mental aspect is still underestimated? Um, I'm trying to to listen to the deeper side of the question. So there, there is a lot of knowledge out there, and I think it's the application of it. I saw a beautiful sort of um, meme the other day. I'm trying to remember who it was who was saying th there was a visual of someone with a hundred books in front of them, and hardly any of that knowledge applied. And then they, the next image in was rather having a handful of books and applying that. So. Knowledge is one thing, practice is another. And so it's one thing to gain knowledge is one to have behavior, but I think you might be touching on the interpersonal side as well. And I think we have to realistically accept that there's a tension where a people, I mean, people come for performance coaching because they want to realize potential, so they're on a journey. So just because there's knowledge um, of how we should conduct ourselves doesn't mean that we're practicing that. So. That's where I think that smart piece comes in. It's is how we do the interpersonal side. So, so I think rather have less principles, mental principles, and fewer relational principles that are actually acted on, than than drowning in knowledge, because knowledge without practice is is really not helpful in the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that the the question also came because we've had some recent experiences in also in international hockey with with uh, Australian women's coaches who had trouble with with the characteristics of a coach towards the team the mm. Dutch women uh, experienced the same thing uh, but several teams uh, have experienced that gymnastics in, in 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 several European countries we've seen coaches who still are working with the old way of, of, of yeah. discipline and hard work and, and overstepping the bounds often. Uh, so how do you yeah. deal with, with if, if, if you're in, in, in a sports environment with different coaches and you've got some younger ones who are open to, to a more clean ego kind of yeah. way of working, but you still got some, some older dogs in there and it's difficult yeah. to teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. How do you deal with that? And, and yeah. And let's just step away from the Astro for a while. Um, even, even if our firm, even if our families are forming differently, but if we've got two families or things, and we have to connect with generations, don't we? Some are very fortunate to have grandparents in the mix or uncles and aunts and parents. And we have to learn to, to correct generationally. D depending on the workplace, we can have four generations in a workplace. So I think there has to be a leaning into each other's space. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but a coaching relationship is very intense, isn't it? Because depending on the level I'm playing, I'm with that coach multiple times a week. So a difficult work boss can ma maybe be suffered if, if you only have to sit through his or her talk once a month, or they only come past your office once a week. And maybe you have the safety of remote working right now, so they never come and breathe physically down your neck. You can mute them. <laughs> but the intense, the problem with a coach is that that could be four or five interactions a week. And there's an intensity to a coaching relationship that few work relationships happen. So um, those are some the, of the... The, re the really remark here. Yeah, I love the remark from, from Bert de Boer here. The coach as a sheepdog. <laughs> yeah. so, so coaches, if you're going to remain relevant and keep motivating the next generation, you're gonna to have to make generational shifts. Mm -hmm. um, as much as the workplace, 
And, and that was my first example with David Reed Ross at the age of 65. He was saying, I was parented in a certain way. I was led in the workplace in a certain way. I was coached in a certain way at an international level. I realized, and that's what he said, as much as my astro skills are outdated, he said, my coaching way is outdated. So um, we have to move to, to, along the lines of what neuroscience is teaching us, the social sciences, relational sciences. We have to be eternal and constant learners as coaches. Uh, absolutely. Question from uh, Lara here. So what are your thoughts on dealing with post big event letdowns? Uh, there were so many delays experienced due to COVID-19. So staying motivated has been challenging as well. But then the afterward, the aftermath of, of, for example, a disappointing World Cup or a disappointing Olympics or a disappointing league or tournament locally. Mm -hmm. It's challenging, isn't it? Um, so we always have to go and give our utmost in a tournament, don't we? We won't live with ourselves. We won't. We need to go and play to the best of our ability. Sometimes those are humbling events because we don't hit it all on song on the right time. Sometimes they're just better than us. So, so go, getting into a big tournament is like looking like a, into a mirror, isn't it? And um, and we have to have the courage. But as athletes. We don't want to just practice, do we? And we don't want to just play in our leagues. We want to play in World Cups. We want to play against the best in the world. And to put ourselves into that arena is to make ourselves vulnerable. And um, so I think some of the better debriefing methods I'm familiar with is that we mustn't debrief soon after the event because either we're too high or too low. But we need to then look back at that. And sometimes there's a grief process. I, I know two South African athletes who never got on the plane to the Tokyo Olympics in the last week because of COVID. I mean, that, that comes around every four years. There's a real grief process. There's a loss. Sometimes there's real loss. Sometimes you're young enough that there'll be another Olympic or two cycle to do it or World Cup cycle or two. You might be at the Roger Federer stage of your career and you're into the last one. So I think it depends on your life cycle. But um, but I think if we get back to what it's ultimately about, it's transforming and growing as a person that is a higher value than winning a tournament. And that if you are endeavoring to hold that why, um, there is life after a loss. And it's hard to stomach that. But um, if we're ultimately defined and my sense of worth is so attached to whether I got gold, gold or silver, does it then mean if I lose the gold medal at the age of 24, does it mean the rest of my life is a wreck? No, it doesn't. It, it means there's grief and disappointment, but, but I carry on because mm -hmm. I'm not defined by one moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it becomes difficult also for a coach if you're dealing with, with different personalities in a team, but also people yeah. with different experiences in a team. Because if you're yeah. leading a team up to a new big event, and there will be people in that team who have had that disappointing experience in, in a recent past of missing out or or yeah. uh, or, or a poor poor uh, performance at, at, at the last big event, and you have the ones who are new to the group and very hungry and, and excited yeah. about what's ahead of them. So how do you deal with that as a coach with all those different stages to get them all to the clean ego? I think that's the wonder of those teams forming. And some who might have the, the bruised memory of losing to a certain team, then you get some young girls and guys who come in who who are not carrying that bruising of having lost to a certain team. So they come in with freshness um, and that can actually um, help the other athlete on who just wonders whether they will ever be able to beat that nation or that team or things. So I think if you forming a team is, you know, it's like a stew or things with all those different juices and coming in. So people are at different places. You ultimately want to need alignment on the effort level and what you're pursuing on the work rates and the commitments. Um, but yeah, I think that's the wonder of teams, isn't it? And yeah. um, that's the wonder of teams. And the wonder of teams is if I'm having a terrible day 
at outside left half sub me. I, that's that's clean ego, Ernst. That's mm -hmm. clean ego to say I was due to play 45 minutes. I'm having a nightmare, Coachy. You know that's clean ego. It's just it's not happening for me today. Or the chap I'm chap or the girl I'm marking is just outwitting me the whole time. Ernst, you're better to play left half today. That's clean ego. Mm -hmm. um, you know I need to reset myself because that person got around me three times. I need to reset myself, but not during this game. It's not happening. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, a, a more technical question, but let let's not answer this as a, as a, as a technical or technical way because that is not your job, obviously. Also, as a, as as a mental coach here, but Shasha mm -hmm. Hockey Academy asking, okay, how to deal with a defender not marking in a man to man when the goalkeeper wants to mark always man to man? And okay, so let's bring that question to okay, how how do you deal ego wise and and and, and mentally? With yeah, so, people not following so, so, team team orders or team consignments yeah. or team agreements. Yeah, so so and so maybe let me comment on on the values part, and then maybe you come in on the technical side or or compliment me there. But um, so yeah, I think we have to agree to structures when we're going out or patterns. So and there has to be buy-in. So so that's. So my ego can't be above, I can't say on the field, well, I'm not following the pattern or the structure because then you're not aligning with the team. So the pattern or structure has authority and one or two people on the field um, should have the, the, the leadership role to call that play. Sometimes you'll change structure. So that's part of team is saying we're 11 on the park together, but we are going to follow a certain pattern. And, and that is alignment. Um, and if you think you have a better version, then best not to do it on the pitch that day, but to resolve that in training and in discussion. But maybe you maybe enrich my answer and and maybe come in on the technical side. Well, that's 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 not my job. I, I never claim to be a coach. <laughs> I bring I bring on I bring on the expert coaches to answer those questions. So uh, we'll talk about that for sure for sure on another time. Um, Coaches, um, any more questions? This this is the 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 last call for for any more of your questions. Bring them on. Um, if not, let me already start by uh, thanking Ian uh, for your time and 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 sharing the knowledge and sharing your insights with us. Um, it's very it's been a very insightful uh, presentation again. So uh, we're very happy with that. Uh, and I guess you you answered most of the questions during your presentation because uh, I'm not seeing any new ones come in. So uh, let's uh, let's leave it here. Um, we maybe will. I should just, yeah, yeah, go. Maybe, maybe should I just come in. That you and I have been hard work in the studio all the day. So I think we're wanting these masterclasses to be a bit of an appetizer and an awareness. But we're working hard behind the scenes to bring something to you in a few weeks' time, where we look at different modules of mental mm -hmm. coaching input from top players and coaches. So there can be a deeper dive. Um, the masterclass, obviously, you can skim the surface of something in, in mm -hmm. 45 minutes, but we, we wanting to create those deeper dives for people. So watch the space, yeah. Absolutely. We, we will bring you, uh, in, in the weeks to come, we will bring you a, a full online course where we go deeper into uh, into this topic. So uh, keep watching uh, thehockeysite.com for, for more about, uh, about this. and. Uh, uh, next week, we are back with uh, another coach chat. So uh, until then, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ian, for sharing the knowledge with us. Pleasure. And uh, thanks, coaches, for uh, sharing your questions with us. And uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.